All right, Leanne. Well, thank you very much, and welcome everybody to uh, AxCon and uh, this afternoon's sessions. I think getting started now, um, we're going to talk about the return on investment of accessibility today. A couple of quick things as we go, though, that I've noticed this morning in some of the sessions. So you see the, the chats you have there. Some people were talking about not seeing it scroll. Um, so you might want to switch it to most recent. Um, so you can see the comments as they come in rather than most popular, which is by default, I think. So that might help you. Um, and then the other quick thing too, was just to say, I know if you haven't gotten your, your book yet, some of the things I'm going to talk about here, uh, a lot of it actually, you know, tunes directly into the book that Dylan Barrell's written that that's been discussed earlier today. So make sure and get your book and, and read through that if you, if you haven't had a chance to do that. So um, I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, the return on investment of accessibility. So it's it's funny this morning. I was listening to the keynote speakers. I was listening to Mr. Surf and uh, and then uh, Preeti and uh, Dylan. And as we talk about this, it's and I, and I think Mr. Surf put it the right way. He said, you know, re ROI doesn't sound like the right term here, um, and he's correct. And we really shouldn't think about things in that way, but. The business world being the business world, we, we have to. And so I may change the title on this at some point, more to talk about the business case of accessibility, because the reality is, as you try to add accessibility into your organization, um, especially to, you know, do the work to make it sustainable, um, it's going to cost, you know, money and time to do that. And money and time, when you're thinking about being in the boardroom, um, just saying, you know, it's the right thing to do, unfortunately, is not always going to get you um, what you need. I, I think it should, and I think someday it will. Um, but for right now, we have to think about these other aspects of it. And so the information I'm going to share with you today is going to help you to paint that picture, to, to maybe illustrate for people who don't quite get it yet, that not only is it the right thing to do, it's also just good business as well, and good business for four main reasons that I'm going to share with you today. So what are the aspects of return on investment for accessibility, or what are the business cases um, that we can talk about? And as I said, there's four main ones um, that I want to discuss, and those four will do some, some seriously positive things for your organization. The first thing to think about is your market share. And we're going to talk about market share. We're going to talk about e-commerce. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the disruption of COVID in 2020 and what that meant to e-commerce and what that meant um, to people who suddenly might not have had any options other than the digital storefront to be able to, you know, get the product or service that they wanted. Um, so we'll talk about that. We're also going to talk about operational costs, and this is operational costs in an omnichannel organization. So if your organization has uh, brick and mortar storefronts and you've got a digital presence, you've got call centers, you've got payment centers, if you're financial, we'll talk about um, how shifting those costs in the right channel um, are going to help you and you can do that with accessibility. Um, we are going to talk about risk profile and this is the, the lawsuits. And although I think this is really a, a negative motivational factor. And I put it third on this list. In fact, I should probably put it fourth on this list. But I put it third on this list on purpose because I don't think that should be the main thing that we pursue here because the, the value of the first two that I talked about there outweigh the value of risk mitigation. Um, and probably the fourth one, which is aligning your digital presence with your company core values and, and thinking about things like social justice, again, more valuable to your company in the long run if you can get people to think in those terms. So those four things uh, that we're going to go through, give you some information, um, help you be able to put together some business case. This is all real world data. Um, the references are in there as well. And of course, at any time you can contact me. Um, I've helped over the last two or three years, dozens of companies um, create a business case and look at the return on investment and look at how they can improve their business and get the funding they needed to produce accessible digital content. So I'd, be, I'd love to help you as well. So let's talk about market share in e-commerce first. And I've got claim your portion of the pie. Um, it's a big pie out there. There's a lot of money um, and a lot of people involved. And I'm just going to talk about um, the U.S. marketplace right now. I do have um, efforts to get data on the European market, on the Far East market, different places uh, where I'm trying to get more information. It's a little harder to come by there, but there's a similar story. 
Um, and we know that similar um, situations exist, but for right now, let's just focus on the United States. And we do know that the, the after-tax disposable income for working age people with disabilities is approximately $490 billion, so just short of $500 billion. And again, this is a group, the people with disabilities group, that are likely going to need some type of an accommodation to work with your digital storefront. So if you have a digital storefront that's not um, accessible or, you, or you're trying to provide services and, and there's not an accessible way to procure those services, this is the type of market share that you're looking at not servicing. Um, comparison's sake, so what does 490 billion mean in the in the larger scheme of things if we think about other aspects of diversity and inclusion? Well, for comparison's sake, the African American market is 501 billion and the Hispanics market is 582 billion. So a significant amount of money out there in people who are looking to achieve goods and services. And by the way, today, um, I had a friend of mine um, who is blind, say, I think it was maybe a couple years ago, he said, it, it's a great time to be blind. And what he meant by that is that there's more than one choice uh, for people today when before there were fewer choices. So if you're not accessible and your competitor is, then somebody's just going to switch over and get their product or their service from somebody else. And then we talk about the people. So 20 million, 35% of all people with disabilities, U.S. working age, again, adults age 16 to 64. Um, this data comes from several sources. It'll be in the slides there too, but you also heard Mr. Cerf talk about a billion people worldwide having some type of disability, whether it's a you know permanent or temporary disability. So lots of money, lots of people. Um, and we look across that disposable income and say, well, where do we see uh, which disabilities um, you know, in this income statistics and this this data that we have. And um, on the chart that I have here, it just shows the disposable income again in billions. Um, so you get that that billions scale, but vision difficulty, hearing, um, self-care, ambulatory, cognitive, and independent living, um, with independent living being the highest and ambulatory being the second highest, and then hearing difficulty and vision being uh, third and fourth. So this gives you an idea of how those numbers are spread across the people with disabilities community. And then taking that a step further, let's look very specifically within the e-commerce specific um, data. So from the e-commerce statistics that we can get, um, we understand, and this is, these are some numbers from 2018. I've got some <clears throat> draft numbers from 2019. And for, for a lot of reasons, we probably will think of 2020 as an anomaly, but in 2018, the approximate total there was $517 billion. So based on some research that DQ did um, with a research company, we commissioned a, a company to help us with this, 2% of those total e-commerce transactions are completed by people who are blind. This is assuming less than half, so that 5% of the population. And that means that that total market available there is about 10.3% you know, a billion dollars, just that one piece. So that's the e-commerce market size for accessibility. Um, and if we look in that research, we see that 90%, and Dylan mentioned this earlier today too, so 90% of internet sites or maybe even a little bit higher have critical accessibility blockers. So there's something in the website, something in the flow, whether you're trying to, you know, get a service or buy a product or pay a bill that's keeping people from, from, achieving the intent of the content. Um, so that's a, that's a very high number. Um, and so if I take that 90% and I'm just going to, you know, using the numbers here from Matt, that inaccessible accessible e-commerce, so retailers are losing out on $6.9 billion a year. And to just give you an idea of the scale, I like to give people, you know, the scale of the numbers we're talking about too, uh, homedepot.com reported an annual revenue of 6.94 billion in 2018. So an entire Home Depot's worth of revenue is, is being lost out because customers don't just abandon that purchase. They're going to buy someplace else. They have other options. They're going to go use those other options. So again, if, if you're talking to the people in your company who are making the financial decisions, if you're talking to them about the need to service this community, absolutely talk about that it's the right thing to do, but also talk about that it's the fiscally responsible thing to do. I and mean, you look at these numbers and how could you say that a company with shareholders wouldn't say, this is something we should focus on, absolutely should. The next thing I wanna talk about 
is I want to talk about operational costs. So, and let me define that um, a little bit for you. So we talked about omnichannel organizations, organizations that would have um, perhaps a mail-in center, and let's use financial as an example. So they probably got some type of mail-in center where you can make payments or deposit checks, what have you. They've also probably got brick and mortar. So they've got brick and mortar branches. Um, they're going to have the website where you can do most, if not all of your financial transactions now. And they're also going to have some type of call center where you can call in and get service and probably execute those same uh, transactions. In fact, a key for most omnichannel organizations is that this be uh, similar, if not exactly the same across each channel and also give you the opportunity to pick up and move from channel to channel during um, whatever task you're trying to do. So you may start out on the web and end up on the phone or vice versa, you know, however it is you're trying to complete your transaction. So in doing this, if your digital channel is not accessible, obviously you've got a large hole in the organization. And one of the biggest holes you've got in terms, it, it will be just in terms of cost because typically, and I, I would like to say always here, but I'll say typically, but I can't imagine the digital channel is going to be the cheapest way for your company to do business. So um, I've done a little study here, and this is with an actual Fortune 500 company, and we were looking at the uh, mechanics and the cost around making a payment. So just simply making a payment on something, a credit card, a car loan, um, a home loan. So if you looked at the cost of making that payment in this organization, um, if somebody walked in, so this is a brick and mortar staffed agent facility. So we're going to take it, we're going to account for everything that goes on here all the way down to the power and the water for the facility, everything it takes is about $15 um, to make that payment. From a call-in perspective, you still have the brick and mortar facility. You've got a staff call center, you've got trained people there. So although there aren't, you know, the call centers are, are typically, you know, large and fewer of them, it's still going to cost you some money, but they do cut that number in half down to $7.50. From a mail-in perspective, again, another brick and mortar um, facility, and I don't know if you've ever seen these giant mail sorters that take the envelope and open it up and pull the check out and scan the check and deposit the check, but it's quite the operation to see, but then there's also a ton of, you know, mechanical interaction in there, so also some very costly you know, places just to set up, you know, let alone run with the people and the technicians you have to have to do that. But again, it's a little cheaper at $2 and 50 cents. And then finally click in. So I've got kind of somebody coming into my, my virtual digital website and, and doing this make a payment transaction. And again, I'm taking in all the costs here. So the data center costs, the servers, the power, the cooling, the whole bit, but it's just 50 cents for somebody to make a payment. So the difference between walking in and clicking in $14 and 50 cents making a payment on your car. So let's see, if we want to have a proper channel mix for our company, very likely we want to minimize walk-in and we want to maximize click-in. So here we have what we want versus what it actually is. So what, we, what most companies want is they would target maybe 5% for walk-in, where in actually it's probably about 60%, but it's declining. You know, fewer people go into their banks every day, um, but still, you know, do the same transactions and get the same services. Call in, you know, maybe 15% of the target is actually 20. Mail in 20% of the target, but it's actually 15. And then click in, the target being 60%, but the actual is 5%. We're still in a position where the majority of the transactions that we see people doing are not necessarily the e-commerce transactions, but that grows more and more every year. And again, for 2020, because of COVID, we saw a huge spike in the amount of activity in these digital storefronts. Now, the channel cost for 1.5 million payments, if I look across those, I'm just gonna take the actuals. So 60% walk-in, 20% call-in, 15% mail-in, 5% uh, click-in, and I use the costs, the per unit cost that I had before, is gonna come out that the total cost of payment processing all channels per month, if I think about 1.5 million transactions, which, some of you, your companies are large enough, you probably have 1.5 million transactions per day uh, or 1.5 million transactions per hour. So we'll just say 1.5 million when to keep the numbers you know, safe and easy to work with. $16.35 million um, to take those 1.5 million um, make a payment transactions in a month. Now, what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to improve 
the accessibility of the digital channel because I want to increase it. So I had looked at 5% actual on the digital channel, which is click in, and I'm going to just increase that up to 15%. And for that total that I took for the 10% that I'm adding to the click in, and I'm kind of clipping back and forth so you can see the difference here. I'm going to have 15% now and just add that reduction of 3.33% across those other channels and say walk in, call in, and mail in will decrease by 3.33%, but click in is going to increase by the aggregate, which is 10%. I'm using the same per unit cost. I'm using the same 1.5 million payments per month. Um, and so if I improve the accessibility of the digital channel and I can add more people there, which I likely will if people were trying to use it before, now the total cost of those payment processing is going to cost me 15 point, about 15.2 million. So the difference there comes out to a monthly savings just for this one transaction and then just a 3.33% change from one channel to another to that monthly savings of $1.162 million. If I look at this over an entire year, that's 13.9, that's almost $14 million. And who couldn't run an outstanding accessibility program on 14 million a year? In fact, who couldn't run an outstanding program on half that much? So if you're trying to make these numbers fit something that's gonna get your chief financial officer's attention and you're in an omnichannel organization, and they're trying to improve the usage of their digital channel, but it's not accessible, this is a very concrete way to not only show them how you can gain money and pay for more, so you've got return on investment, right? Because how much you've spent on accessibility is greatly eclipsed on how much you're going to save the company in these operational costs. Um, this is some outstanding information to, to help them see that. And then by the way, after we do that, let's watch it and try to figure out some way through feedback or other mechanisms to attribute the growth in that digital channel to, you know, the usability overall or the accessibility of the channel. So for, again, those organizations that have this, this is an outstanding way for you to, to show what's going on in those channels and to show your senior folks um, how this makes a big difference and how it actually pays for itself. So that's the second uh, way to do it. Let's talk about the um, aspects of that, though, before we get into the third one. And what I want to do is, again, this was the study that DQ had commissioned um, that we did with um, uh, people with disabilities group, primarily people who are blind. Um, and, and we interviewed them and collected information. But what we saw is that people who are blind call a company's customer service department once a week on average because of accessibility issues. 90% of those interviewees that we talked to said that they call multiple times to report an issue, even though they've maybe abandoned trying um, to do the transaction. So again, remember those costs, the cost difference between somebody calling in and somebody calling in multiple times for an issue. And just imagine the cost of that continuing over time when you could address that cost simply by making your digital channel fully accessible. Now let's talk about risk management. So this is the one that, that I think everybody starts out with. It's, it's the lawsuit. Everybody's scared of the complaint. Everybody's scared of the lawsuit. Um, we heard earlier this morning, Christina talked about, um, she gave an entire hour's worth of updates on statistics, which I've got the same statistics in here just for illustration. But when we look at um, the situation, there are a lot of lawsuits that people are filing and they're filing them in federal court, they're filing them in state court, they're ADA lawsuits, Department of Justice gets involved. Um, and the reason that's occurring is because we have the Americans with Disabilities Act. We have Title II, which covers government entities. We have Title I, which covers what you must do for your employees. We have Title III, which covers places of public accommodation. So places of public accommodation is, is likely where you would see a complaint or a lawsuit if your digital um, storefront is not accessible. And so let's talk about that and talk about those costs for a little bit. And one of the things you'll see here is the study that I did here, again, with uh, three Fortune 500 companies, was to look and see what the actual cost of that was. In fact, I have an entire presentation that's just on this part of it. So you can jump out and look at that at some point on dq.com if you like. But I'm just going to summarize it here. Um, why do we need to talk about it? Well, we obviously talk about it because I talked about that growth. So these are just the year over year Title III lawsuits filed, number of them, all basis. So this is and this is both uh, physical and digital accommodation. But you can see in 2013, we had 2,722. 
And then year over year, some years with huge increases, like from 13 to 14, which was a 63% increase, um, but then sometimes smaller. So 19 and 20, again, we'll consider 2020 an anomaly year, um, you know, staying about the same or decreasing a little bit. But we've seen those go from, you know, 2000 around in up to, you know, in excess of 10,000 a year in 2018, 2019, and 2020. And in fact, what Christina shared with us this morning is I think they expect that 2021, based on early data, may be a record year um, because there's probably some some pent up frustration last year, um, things that were illustrated that we maybe wouldn't have seen without the COVID lockdowns as well as action that just didn't get taken um, because everything was locked down. So we could see quite the year this year. And then where are we seeing these things focused at? Um, I apologize, I don't have the graphic. Um, for California on here, I'll add it to the slide, but I couldn't get it in time. That's how late breaking some of this information is. But then where do we see those, you know, which states are those popping up again? Again, this information uh, from this morning's presentation. So California has about 5,800, New York has 2,200, and then Florida having 1,208 of those. And then they continue to be spread across a myriad of different industries, both products and service. So there's really no place that's absolutely safe from these types of lawsuits. If you are selling a product or a service and you have a digital presence and you have a method um, for doing and providing service in the digital channel, then you need to make that accessible. If you don't, very likely um, you're going to eventually see a lawsuit in that space. So let's talk now about the cost of the complaints. So I want to talk about complaints first, and then I'm going to talk about lawsuits. But what I'm doing here is I'm collecting information on what actually occurs when a complaint happens, not just um, the actual fines and settlement costs and, and lawyer fees and things that come from the lawsuit, but what actually happens, what, what things occur. So call center people have to get involved and probably call center management. We've got your compliance and your regulatory people involved, your product management, developers, QA and testing and deployment and operations, because theoretically, whatever the complaint comes in on, you're going to have to fix it, right? So I've got a, a big chart up here that I'm not going to completely um, cover in this presentation, but of course, when once you get the presentation, you can dig through it in the table. But what this is showing is the number of people involved, number of hours they might spend working on this complaint, and then the extended cost um, based on an average cost for people in your company. So you can use the average hour for whatever you like, but you can see that when you get the complaint, you're going to have somebody who receives the complaint, you're going to document it, you're going to process it, you're going to spool up a project to fix it, then you're going to have to design code and test what you're doing. Then you've got to issue it back out to production and spool down the project and then finally follow up with the customer. So you can see the extended costs on these, it very quickly adds up. Um, it adds up to a lot, right? So the reactive fix um, cost here that we have is about $9,949 $9, when I add everything up in this extended cost here. What we're talking about in scale factor versus design, so that potential cost of this complaint, if you're practicing accessibility and you have a defect that's injected in the design phase, and you address it right in the design phase. Let's take a very simple example. Um, we should have had alternative text on an image that really means something to the content and it wasn't put there. If I fix it right then, it's a very quick fix. I fixed it in design. There's probably one or two people involved. We're done. So the proactive fix cost on that is gonna be very cheap. It's gonna be probably an hour or less of, of somebody's time, hopefully for alt text, an hour or less. But then the reactive fix loss that we just figured up is almost a hundred times that much. So that's how much more money we're injecting into that when we see the reactive fix loss coming out at $9,949. And then if you get a hundred complaints over a year and each one of them has this type of activity associated with it. Now, this is probably gonna be worst case because hopefully you would bundle these up and put them you know, in a project instead of having a project for every single one, but we'll take the worst case number and just say it could be upwards of a million dollars a year. Now, this is just responding to complaints and fixing issues that you've found in production versus fixing those issues when they occurred or not having the issues at all. This is what DQ refers to as shift left 
Shift left means you're fixing the issue, you're addressing accessibility as early in the software development lifecycle as possible, and that's where you save the immense amount of money here. Now I want to talk about lawsuits and what happens with a lawsuit, which is going to have some of the same activities that we have with the complaint, but now we're going to add some very expensive people. So in fact, I'm going to take the blended rate up to $225 an hour and say, I've got senior company leadership. I've got those compliance and regulatory personnel. I've got internal legal counsel, internal legal support, internal subject matter experts, external subject matter experts, centralized accessibility team leadership, developers, QA, deployment, operations, marketing. And realize that all the people that I've listed here, all of these, these skill sets and all of the resources that I have, this is really what it takes to do. I mean, this is really what happens at these companies when they've got a lawsuit. These are the people that have to come out and deal with this lawsuit. And you're probably going to have to keep your C-suite uh, you know, up to date on what's going on, too. So it's taking expensive time from expensive people. So the potential costs here. So you're going to have, as I said, more expensive people and more expensive, resor expensive resources. It's going to have a protracted response. So there's, there are very few lawsuits that happen over a short amount of time. So this is going to be burdensome. Somebody's going to have to keep their mind on this and keep things rolling and figure out what's going on and report it back and get direction and take action. Um, as I said, it's going to involve the senior levels of your company because they want to know about their company's aggregate risk. I would if it were my company. And then typically, it's also going to call for outside counsel. So you're probably going to have to hire a law firm um, who can practice where the lawsuit was filed and who has experience in dealing with accessibility or Americans with Disabilities Act lawsuits. So we're going to go back to the same type of table here, but you can see that now I'm talking about things that that happen when the lawsuit comes in. So the lawyers are gonna to have to be assigned, the business is notified. Um, you're gonna to have to retain outside counsel. So you can see I've put a cost in for that. Um, you're gonna to have to issue hold orders to people. And what that means is that during a lawsuit, you can't destroy any records that may be pertinent to it. So there's some special processing that'll have to take place so that you're not you know, doing any illegal records management, I'll put it that way, on things that pertain to the case. And, and that actually takes people time to do, to identify those things and set them aside. Uh, some judges order very early discovery. So if the judge orders early discovery and you have to provide things like your policies and maybe your um, internal standards or, or your, your software development life cycle documentation, that's going to take time. You're going to have to prep for court status hearings. You're going to have to prep for negotiations. You're going to go to court. You're going to negotiate all these things that you're going to have to do. And keep in mind that this illustration is for a small, quickly settled lawsuit. This isn't even counting one where you've decided to contest it and we're going to actually go to court um, and, and fight the issue. Then you've also got settlement drafts, settlement draft reviews, finalization processing, and now you've got to release your hold order. So all those records that you kept now have to be released so that they can be destroyed when they're supposed to be destroyed on your regular retention timeline. And then you've got to close the project and file and document, take, document everything. So this means your litigation grand total. Again, just the activities that the people are undertaking and these extended costs plus your outside counsel retainer. So there's two things that are not represented in this. I haven't represented any potential DOJ um, fines that are issued or any damages. And I also haven't um, listed anything for a settlement cost. So $356,775 just in activity of people doing things that are required when you receive and have to process a lawsuit inside of your company an immense amount of money, much higher than, so you hear people say, oh, I settled it for 20 or $25,000. Well, 20 or $25,000 plus the $350,000 that you just had to spend on all this activity. So there's no such thing as a cheap lawsuit in this space. Um, and I've had, I, I presented this at uh, CSUN a couple years ago, and there were a few lawyers in the room, and most of them came and said they thought that my costs were actually low here. So we might use this as the best case example instead of the worst case example. Then think about something else you could add on top of this, which could be potential DOJ action. And we heard this morning again in the legal update that the DOJ could, you know, levy a fine up to 96,000 and change for first action and 192,000 for subsequent actions, as well as requiring your website to become accessible in probably a very aggressive 
amount of time. So it's going to force you into action that's going to disrupt your company. Um, it's going to take extra time and extra money and just not a good practice to get into when you could have spent all of this money proactively on building an accessible website. So again, you know, things that may or may not happen to your company, but things that have happened to a ton of companies and money that they put someplace other than where it would have done the best good for the company, for the shareholders, for the customers. So we've talked about the, the numbers associated with that. We've talked about the market share. We've talked about e-commerce. We've talked about um, the channel costs. And we've talked about risk. Now let's talk about alignment with core values and let's talk about social justice or to, I think, quote, uh, Mr. Surf this morning will say it's just the right thing to do. I think that's even kind of how he said it. Um, it is the right thing to do. And so what I've done here is I've just collected some company mottos, if you will, and I'll just read through them real quick. But and you can, you know, maybe you'll recognize the company and maybe not, but um, there's a cheat at the bottom of the slide. When you get the actual deck, there's the names are there. So here to help life go right, or you're in good hands with, or life's better when we're connected. Our clients' interests always come first. Leading the way where there's a helpful smile in every aisle. Our vision is to be the Earth's most customer-centric company or be what's next. So with models like that, if your mission stated, again, look back and read these again, if your mission is to be inclusive, connected, customer-driven, simple, helpful, customer-centric, how can accessibility not be part of that? It's just impossible. So everything else failing, you can go to the marketing people and say, look, at you've, you've got a great marketing strategy, but you're not following through with it. How are you following through if accessibility is not part of what we're doing? Um, so another strong argument for just doing what is right. And social justice concerns are, are definitely on the rise. And if you have a group of people that's being treated uh, poorly, let's say, you get uh, a lot of negative press or perhaps you'll get uh, people saying, I'm not gonna buy your product anymore. So some serious consequences in the last several years um, to these types of questions. So you definitely wanna be out in front of it and not behind it. Um, there's another piece I put in this back in 2019, I found this and I put it in here because I just thought it was very interesting. And I'll say since 2019, I'm not sure I've seen a demonstration of this thought, but there were a group of top CEOs that said maximizing shareholder profits no longer can be the primary goal of corporations. Now, this was just before COVID. I think it was a very end of 2019. The actual story in the Wall Street Journal, I think, is referenced um, in the slide deck as well, so you get that. But think about what these groups of CEOs are saying after everything we've seen, you know, in the previous couple of decades. Um, it, you know, profits is not the only thing that we need to do. We need to be good corporate citizens. We need to focus on, you know, good for all, on inclusiveness. So another way that you can work this into your organization. Again, we talked about social justice issues on the rise. There are tests, uh, tech companies that face pushback for contracts with immigration and border control. Retailers face calls to halt firearm sales, uh, sales, I'm sorry, increasingly vocal calls on social issues, racism, LGBTQ plus equality, people with disabilities, equality, ageism, you know, pick, pick your, your issue. And um, I'm happy to say that there are outspoken advocates now for all of these. And I, I really like the way this is growing. But again, because it's growing, you have to think about what you say and, and being inclusive means you're inclusive of everyone. So a couple of other things to leave you with real quickly before we get to questions. So customers are increasingly looking to spend money with companies that share their views. Again, this came from the study that we did. Um, and, and in that study also, we found that the, in the study group, customers who were happy or unhappy with um, a company because of accessibility tended to communicate that strongly to their family and friends and colleagues. And so you've got kind of a groundswell of either satisfaction or dissatisfaction based on that as well. All right, well, this brings us down to questions. So I think Leanne has been watching as we go and, and hopefully we got some good questions and I will try to answer what you put forth. Sure, um, thank you, Greg, that was awesome. Uh, we have a few thank questions you. here from the participants. So um, one of the questions is, are there any case studies or companies who have seen an increase in profit after making their website or application accessible? 
This will be great information and ammunition when discussing accessibility of decision makers. Yes, the holy grail question. I've, I've given this presentation or parts of it several times and I always get that question and I'll say that I think I'm closer than ever before to finding this. However, it's going to be difficult to find because, you know, companies aren't classifying, rightly so, companies aren't classifying the difference between people with disabilities and, and you know, the other uh, people that are doing business with their company. So it's been very hard to pull that out of the data and say that mm -hmm. this particular increase in profit occurred because of what we've done with accessibility. So I'll say I don't have a concrete example of that yet. I'm working with several companies to try to build ways to do that, but it's tricky to do that because um, of the way that, you know, we, we certainly don't want to track a particular population, you know, through the companies. I think that would be a negative thing um, to even ask anyone, you know, if they're using an assistive technology, it's just not the kind of question you ask. So that's what holds us up from getting that. I think we'll get it someday, but it, it's not quite there yet. Good question, by the way. Okay. Um, here's another question. If you were to prioritize the various return on investment practices, which one do you think is the most important one to focus on? Yeah, so I, I think the most important one that's going to help you sell this is probably going to be the market share. And if you're an omni-channel organization, the um, argument about channel costs. Um, at some point in your organizational change um, management, in, as you begin to help gain awareness on the people with disabilities community, to help gain awareness on, you know, how easy it can be to put accessibility into your products if you focus on it at the right time using the right types of tools and the right types of processes and procedures and guidelines um, that people are going to say, oh, this is just the right thing to do. But until, until they, they get that part of it or they truly understand disability accommodation and accessibility, you're going to have to talk their language and their language is going to be money. Um, and they're going to want to know how much is this going to cost me? How is this going to save me something on the other end? Or how's it going to grow my business or meet some type of goal that my business has? So, that's why I think that those two are probably key to focus on at this point. Now, coming up very quickly is the social justice one. Anybody who's, you know, hasn't had their head in the sand the last two or three years should understand that that's coming to bear and, and start to work on that too. There's a lot of unmeasurable potential there um, that I think people are starting to understand. So also a good question. Great. Um, another question comes in. The big picture is to make everything and everyone have the ability to play in the same arena. With that, the biggest investment is driving consumers to your website instead of a competitor. Will you say that this is your best return on investment? Uh, can you ask that question again? I'm not sure I got um, I think the question is... What does it restate with, the question? <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the biggest investment is driving consumers to your website instead of going to a competitor's website. Would you say that this is your best returns on investment argument? Yeah, I mean, it's a... It, so mm -hmm. I think I understand what they're asking. Now. So yes, it is a, it is a huge part um, of that argument to get people to your website. And I think that where we typically have not looked at accessibility as a competitive advantage, I, I don't think everybody always thinks of it that way. It is becoming a competitive advantage and it's really becoming that way just because of what my friend said a couple of years ago, it's a great time to be blind, right? Because I have options, because I can do different things. So um, yeah, I think getting people getting people to your store and doing business with you and, and helping them be satisfied in everything before the sale, during the sale, after the sale is a key to business retention. And there's just so much competition out there um, that getting the word out that your storefront is completely accessible um, is, is going to become a competitive advantage if it isn't already. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, here's another question. Tell me more about why that lawsuit cost in your study seems higher than what I've seen. Yeah, so the, the difference in what I did and what others have done, so people have typically just focused on, well, what were the, what were the legal fees? Um, what was the settlement cost? And what were the fines? 
if any. So if we just focused on the legal fees and the settlement cost and the fines, sometimes those um, are, well, most times those are, are quite a bit lower, but it's really all the activity that's generated because of the lawsuit or compos- because of the complaint. And then not only the activity, but the disruption to your business as you have to go and address something that maybe wasn't immediately in your timeline. So now you're disrupting other plans, you're disrupting other movement, and you're trying to do something out of sequence. Plus, you're, you've got all of this activity taking place with people who have you know, other jobs to do. There's nobody just sitting around at your company saying, okay, waiting on a lawsuit. When it gets in here, I'm going to take care of those records. Right? I mean, these people all have other jobs. So <laughs> that's, that's, that's where you're going to get the, the issues that come in. And that's why I, I did the study in that specific way to show you that even if you settled for a dollar, let's see the old price is right. We settled for one dollar, right? It's now three hundred and fifty thousand dollars and one dollar, right? Because you still have all that activity. So that's that's why I think that's that surprises people sometimes, and they like to debate it. I'd love to debate it um, to see what your company processes are. I think it's fun to talk about those things. Um, that's just me, though. But uh, but yeah, I, I'd love to have more information on that. But that's why it seems seems higher. Okay. Um, so here is another question: Is WCAG 2.0 A and AA the goal? What is the returns on investment to go beyond that? Oh, yes, this is a great one. No, with CAG is not the goal. <laughs> so that's in, in, see, this is, so I'll get a, I'll get a huge, I'll get a huge argument started up here. I, I will never advise a company that their goal is to be conformant with a guideline, right? Web content accessibility guidelines. Um, that could be the goal if that's specified in the legislation, right? But Really, your goal is that your content can be used by everyone, regardless of ability, um, or regardless of whether they're using accommodation tools or not. Right? And and what that means is that you have some leeway within the guidance itself to make things accessible, but may not maybe not 100% conformant. So, remember, use WCAG as your guideline, but don't get too caught up into the the notion of trying to make it 100% conf. Uh, WCAG conformant, because that last little bit you may go after may have almost no impact on the user experience at all. Um, but it's expensive to get to. Now, conversely, there are things you can do that WCAG may not require that would have a tremendous impact on your experience, right? In the way the thing is designed and just the inherent usability of it. So I, I sometimes, you know, for some things don't go all the way to WCAG, some things you know, blast right on past it. Remember, it's a competitive advantage world. This is becoming a competitive advantage. So the usability of your website, including accessibility, becomes something that can set you apart. So I'll say there's no, there's no top end to it. Um, just make sure that you know your audience and that you're making sure that your content can be used by everyone, again, regardless of ability. So that's a great question. Um, so we have a question from Gareth. He's asking, do you have stories for the return on investment on making internal employee facing systems accessible? Oh, yes. So I don't, we didn't really talk. We didn't talk title one too much in here. So uh, unfortunately, I've seen and I think this is the, the lawsuit effect, right? This is why I don't list lawsuits first. Unfortunately, I've seen a title one, which is what you do for your employees kind of get pushed to the back a little bit because typically you can accommodate your employees a little bit well, but uh, a little easier than you can accommodate somebody out um, in the public. But I do have stories about that. And I'd love to have some more and I'd love to talk about them because if you think about an employee, um, you've just hired the smartest person and the best person for your job. And yet you're not providing them something they need to do their job. This is the whole notion, you know, the person wants a pin, you know, don't save, a dollar for lack of a million dollars in the output that this person is going to be able to do, right? So when you enable that person fully to, to bring, you know, their authentic self to work and to not have to have somebody sitting beside them reading some screen to them to be able to schedule PTO on their own, to be able to look at their own W-2, the, the things that come with that, the job satisfaction, the productivity, uh, the increase in, the, you know, their ability to you know, overcome issues or innovate for your company. I mean, it's incredible the things that you get there. And so, I mean, my answer to that is why in the world would you hamstring somebody coming in? You want the best people to work. So that's a, also a very good question. I didn't have that stuff in here because this was primarily covering Title Three. 
Um, I'm gathering information to talk more about Title I because I know people are becoming more interested in that. So, so yeah, more to come on that one. But yeah, I, did that answer that? Okay. Sorry, I got a little excited about that one. I, I get excited about <laughs> stuff too. So, absolutely. Um, we have a question, but that's uh, it's a little bit on the legal side, so we might not be able to answer this. But the question's related to, um, for legal reasons, do courts go by WCAG or usability? Oh, um, so yeah, this is a little legal. I'm not a lawyer. This is not legal advice. Um, I'm just telling you what Greg has read with GW, if they call me GW at DQ, what GW has seen, um, most of it is is going off of WCAG. In fact, the predatory uh, lawsuits, I'll say there's there's some people out there filing lawsuits just because they want to get a settlement a quick settlement out of it. They use WCAG because it's easy to say, um, I call it the murder lawsuit. So it's, they list 10 different ways you could commit murder and then say, I accuse you of committing murder. <laughs> so here's the, here's the web content accessibility guidelines. I accuse you of not following those guidelines because that's been referenced at some point through some litigation. Um, so that's typically what you see people coming through. It's not about the usability of it. They're trying to say that you're not meeting some portion of that accessibility guideline, which comes back to usability. Um, but some companies aren't very, or some plaintiffs aren't very specific when they say that. They'll just quote the WCAG criteria and, you know, accuse you of not following it. I, I think the main thing here is they should be talking about some type of injury. What can or can't they do, you know, because of how your website is built or architected, but yeah, it's, it's, I don't see it nearly as much on the actual usability more they're arguing about the guidelines itself. Great, so um, I think we have time for about one or two more questions. Here's another one. How could we make a case for accessibility in companies outside of the US where the law isn't so clear and the risk of lawsuits isn't a driver? Forget about the law and the risk of lawsuits, I guess. <laughs> so that's number three moving to number four on my list. And I would again say that even though it may not be, so think about, think about a marketplace where this is not required at all. And think about those market statistics that I just gave you. So whether we choose to focus on it or not, there is still this community of people with disabilities in the world that may be a billion people. Um, so if they're not focusing on it at all and you focus on it and you create that competitive mm -hmm. advantage where nobody else is, I mean, that's, that's, that's brilliant, right? So I would say focus on those other pieces, especially if they're not mandating it. If all your other companies are lazy and not doing it and you do it, think about the advantage you just built. It's tremendous. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So one last question. Um, mm -hmm. What would you say to people in a company actively trying to stop accessibility efforts? Oh my, actively trying mm -hmm. to stop. Well, I guess I would have to, I, I've run into this too, right? So, I mean, it's happened. The main approach I have to that is to try to have um, adult conversation, but sometimes you can't, you, you have trouble with the adult conversation because if somebody's saying that, then they're, they haven't been informed or perhaps they don't have data to back up their position, but try to have an adult conversation about why. You know, why don't you be, and steer away from it's, it's the right thing to do. I mean, that's, that's an obvious one. Um, this is like arguing politics, right? If, you, if you're a liberal and you're arguing with a conservative, you know, are you really going to change each other's viewpoint? Maybe not. But in this case, you can change it with some data, especially the data I had about the market share, um, the data I had about the omnichannel, the channel costs, um, and those types of things. So break it, bring it down into a business question. And I, I would I would bet you're going to be able to back them into a corner on that business question where they can't say that this is a bad idea, because it, you know if it's a large company, you're not going to spend a billion dollars making it, it doesn't cost a billion dollars to make your content accessible. Um, it's a very reasonable cost when you look at the overall IT budgets of most companies. So I would say back I would I would back them into a corner with those business questions and try to stay away from the emotional, you know parts of it, but it really, that's a loaded question. It depends on the person, right? And why they're <laughs> saying, why they're trying to stop it. Um, some people are just mean. I don't know. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> hopefully that's not the case, but yeah, try to, try to use the data. Um, always use the data, data back decisions and, and back them into that corner and say how, now I, here's all the data. If you admit this is right, how can you say this is not the right thing to do? 
Great. Thank you so much, Greg, for a great All session. Right. And thank you to everyone for attending. Enjoy the rest of AxCon. All right. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you.